Okay, so firstly, uh, thank you very much, Laura, for that introduction. And uh, I'll just quickly say how nice it is to be allowed out in public again, especially in surroundings such as these. Um, okay, so in, in 1535 and 1536, civic elections in the Yorkshire town of Beverly caused disorder and violence in the town and constitutional wrangling in the Court of Star Chamber. Annually, the trade and craft guilds of Beverly elected 12 governors to preserve the town's political, judicial and economic order. Dating back to at least the mid 14th century, the free election of governors was part of the town's ancient customs and old usages. Yet the 12 governors did not have the ultimate authority in Beverly, which was not an incorporated town, but an archiepiscopal manor within the fief of the Archbishops of York. As recently as 1528, Thomas Wolsey, then Cardinal Archbishop of York, had attempted to curtail Beverly's self-governance, which he claimed had wrongfully and unlawfully usurped upon his manorial rights. So by the 1530s, the townspeople of Beverly had become used to customary and de facto self-government, while the Archbishops of York, including the then incumbent Archbishop, Edward Lee, attempted to assert their de jure rights over the town. These tensions manifested in disputed civic elections and star chamber suits that, as KJ Allison have argued, ultimately ended in the town's achievement of self-government later in the 16th century. So today I'm looking at the emotional language used in the three star chamber suits in order to shed light on how early modern concepts of emotion played out in practice, how they informed and shaped judicial process, and how they interacted with political notions of social status, social role, and civic governance. The Court of Star Chamber was a venue in which political disputes were played out and resolved. It was a prerogative court which technically tried criminal cases involving violence and trespass, but which in reality litigated the political or property disputes underlying those alleged criminal actions. Although it litigated criminal cases, the Star Chamber followed civil law procedure consisting of written pleadings prepared in advance and witness testimony given not in open court, but behind closed doors. Focusing on the early modern church courts and the Court of Chancery, whose procedure was similar to that of Star Chamber, uh, Faye Bound, Alberti, and Mary D. Bailey have shown how indications of passion, anger, and malice were not simply unmediated accounts of social interactions and events, but rather legally constitutive elements of a suit which de that determined legality and guilt. Malice, in particular, referred to a range of mutually reinforcing matters, including action, character, emotion, and true disposition. So in legal context, to prove the presence of negative emotions such as malice was to prove the defendant's guilt. So this paper will examine the Star Chamber Bill surrounding each election before analyzing the emotional lexicon used in this judicial context and how the study of this language can add to our understanding of the experience of early modern politics. So on the morning of the 25th of April, 1535, the burgesses of Beverly assembled in the common hall for the annual election of governors. Although the town ordinances decreed that only residents and guildsmen could be governors, among those elected was Sir Ralph Ellicker, a member of the rural gentry based at Risby, a couple of miles southwest of Beverly. Ellicker and seven of his adherents had already served as governors for the previous year, breaking the ordinance that no individual could be elected governor in successive years. Compounding these issues was the manner of Ellicker's re-election, which had allegedly been carried out by fraud, intimidation, and violence. That year, two Star Chamber bills of complaint were brought against Ellica, one by the several prominent townspeople who supported the Archbishop of York and another by Edward, Archbishop Edward Lee himself. Both bills stressed the Archbishop's authority over Beverly and coupled this with accounts of Ellica's violence and anger at the election and his tyrannous governorship thereafter. Before the election, Ellica had confiscated the bills of nominees supplied by the guilds and replaced them with those who were with the names of those who were pursuing re-election. He also forcibly prohibited around 20 prominent townspeople from attending the election, including the former governor Robert Raffles, who led the suit against him. Consequently, according to the Archbishop, great altercations, variances, and loud voices, voices were heard amongst those gathered in the hall, with the better and greater part of the townspeople firmly standing and affirming that no person ought to be governor two years together. In the face of this opposition, allegedly, 
Uh, Sir Ralph Ellicott and his fellow incumbent governors, Richard Brown and Robert Gray, rose from the governor's bench and threatened and menaced those present with terrible countenance and great, high, opprobrious, unfitting and violent words and threats in order to submit the townspeople to his will. Um, in great fury and with furious countenance, Alec raged and cast off his gown and approached those gathered wearing only his jacket and armed with his wood knife or dagger. With furious countenance and opprobrious words, Gray allegedly attempted to stir up the commons, calling Richard Tabor, Taylor, who was another complainant in the case, a busy fellow and pulled his clothes before he was letted by the discreet counsel of some honest persons in the hall. At this point, Roger Londell, an inhabitant of the town, desired Ellica to be a good master and permit the town the free election it had enjoyed in diverse years past. But Ellica rebu rebuked him with unfitting words, saying openly that he would do him a displeasure if he did meet him in the town. Ellica also rebuked others with opprobrious words, taking one man by the bosom and with strength and violence thrust him and almost cast him on the floor, saying that if, if it were not more for pity than for fear of any man, he would not much dread to strike him in half a dozen more of such wretches with his dagger. So by force and arms, in riotous manner, and against the king's peace, Ellica and the other governors were re-elected to the great, the great inquietation and trouble of the townspeople. Following the election, by violence and against all law, reason and conscience, Ellica revoked the freedom of raffles and of a freeman blocked them from the customary use of common land for their cattle, spent the town's common treasure, and hatefully and cruelly threatened the townspeople and put them in daily fear of bodily harm. According to these elite townspeople, who described themselves as the quiet and honest inhabitants, Ellica led the commons under a perverse liberty that had brought rage, roar, murmur, debate, dissension, and perturbation to the town. And they requested the court to return Beverly peace and quietness. As the commons were those who should govern, should not govern, but be governed, this upending of the proper divinely ordained social order was conceptualized and described in emotional terms, denoting a troubled and unquiet polity. Above all, they claimed, the cause of this unrest was Elica's greedy mind to continue not only a governor, but like a lord in the town. Meanwhile, Lee informed Thomas Cromwell, the King's chief minister, that Ellica was more, a man more meet to be a captain of evil ruled persons than a governor of the town. So what does focusing on this emotional language in this judicial context, context tell us about the experience of politics in early 16th century Beverly? Since star chamber pleadings were drawn up in collaboration with legal counsel and submitted in written form to the court, this language use was deliberate and strategic. As Natalie Zeman Davis and Laura Gowing have shown, judicial records are the products not only of, indiv of individuals who craft plausible and credible narratives that conform with commonly shared ideologies and mentalities, as well as of legal procedure and legal lang language. Um, in the Archbishop's Bill, Ellica's rage was provoked by Laundell's humble appeal for him to be a good master. Here, Laundell was making use of the public transcript by which, as Michael Braddock and John Walter have shown, subordinates could draw on shared discourses and ideologies in order to restore the proper bounds and mutual obligations of interpersonal relationships as part of the constant process of negotiation by which political power was exercised, maintained, and legitimized. The so-called wounding force of this transcript of good mastership and its incomp incompatibility with his revocation of the town's free election is evidenced by Ellica's unfitting outburst of rage. In this judicial context, then, it was possible to ascribe a furious outburst to a common townsman's imputation of the mastership of a landed knight. Another significant moment in the narrative is when Ellica cast off his gown, most likely a robe of civic office, in great fury and approached the assembled burgesses armed with his short sword. Early modern clothing was imbued with social status, Sumptuary laws enforced hierarchical distinctions in dress, and in the Beverly Town ordinances, guildsmen were identifiable by the clothing of their crafts and expected to be properly turned out at elections. As such, Ellica was shedding both his gown and the external mark marker of his status and office in an unrestrained and furious outburst. 
and the judicial record stressed that he was armed and a threat to the peace, thus bringing the disputed election into the jurisdiction of the court. However, at this point, it should be remembered that these accounts of Elica and his followers' actions consist solely of bills of complaint made against him in an adversarial judicial context by his political opponents, and Elica's own voice is noticeably absent as the case material does not survive. However, the combination of Elica's legal ineligibility and the pejorative emotional language used to describe his actions clearly persuaded the court. In a decree made on the 30th of November, 1535, the King's Council solidified the Archbishop's order and rule over the town's people and forbade Elica from becoming a governor at any, at any time hereafter, as well as other gentlemen from purchasing land in the town in order to be elected governor. This seemingly definitive settlement merely set the stage for further unrest in Beverly the following year. At, at an interim election held three weeks later on the 20th of December, the Archbishop's officers did not assent to the townspeople's free election but simply selected such persons as pleased them. The following month, Archbishop Edward Lee claimed to have received a writing under the common seal of Beverly, expressing the submission of the 12 governors and 240 substantial burgesses to abide his good order and direction for the Commonwealth of the town. However, this was denied by others such as John Raffles, alderman of the Baker's Guild, the hat maker John Newcomb, Christopher Sanderson, William Dent, Richard Wilson, and Richard Endike, all of whom had been sued in Star Chamber as members of Sir Ralph Ellicott's faction the previous year, who claimed that the common seal had been taken by force from Sanderson and illegitimately used in order to revoke the town's customary rights and privileges. So either due to the fear of greater frays and other inconveniences in Beverly, or merely as a pretext to retain his special friends, the incumbent governors, who were allegedly more affectionate to the archbishop than the common wheel of the town, Lee ordered the upcoming election of the 25th of April, 1536, be deferred. The incumbent governors announced the deferral in the common hall, ordered its doors to be locked and the rope removed from the common bell. However, on the scheduled day of election, a large number of townspeople of Beverly performed the usual practices of civic elections in the common hall. Whether or not these practices were a free election or a riot depended on two factors. Firstly, it depended on whether the elections were inherent to the town's liberties either by time-honoured custom or by direct grants by kings or archbishops past. Secondly, the legality of the election also depended on the violence or emotional intensity of the inhabitants' actions. As it had been the previous year, emotional language was used in Star Chamber pleadings to describe the characters, motivations and actions of those involved in the case. So stressing the violence of the riot, as he termed it, Lee claimed that around 100 townspeople riotously assembled at seven o'clock. Four men clambered onto the roof of the house in which the common bell was hung, where they damaged the windows, roof and chimney and made great menaces and threats to those inside. The rioters rang the bell three times with such violence and fury that they knocked it out of frame. Then, assembling at the doors of the common hall, with great voices, noise outcry, and outcries, they urged every true breath to true Burgess in a religious procession that was celebrating St. Mark's Day to join them, to join their ranks. Although the well-disposed persons did not, they were joined by those willful disposed persons who were more affectionate to the rioters, who were more affectionate to rioters. At the door of the common hall, without any manner of order, the rioters elected 12 governors. They then attempted to break the door open with great force and violence, but instead broke a window and entered the hall where they administered the accustomed oath accustomed oath of office to the supposed new governors. Later, in order to legitimize the election, they went to the house of John Anderson, the common clerk, to enroll the governor's names. However, Anderson, who was of great age, only did so through fear of the false might and great menace of the rioters. Lastly, at four o'clock, the former ally of Elica, now newly elected governor, Richard Wilson, stood upon a bench in the common hall where he openly and solemnly proclaimed the previous year's complaint against Elica as a means to procure greater grudge against the substantial inhabitants allied to the archbishop. Against these allegations, the defendants claim that they were peacefully assembled to hold a free election that would preserve their ancient liberties from being utterly forfeit into the archbishop's hands. Denying that there was any outcry, 
They claimed that they only used the ladder to ring the common bell as its rope had been removed on the archbishop's orders to prevent any election being held. And that rather than breaking down the door to the common hall, they merely found an unlocked door around the back. Once in the hall, they elected 12 substantial inhabitants according to their old usages in peaceable and quiet manner. This was done not out of love or favor to any individual, but rather for the, for the good order and conservation of the town before departing home in peaceable and quiet manner. Despite this defense, the Archbishop's case was clearly successful. In November 1536, an agreement settled the long running power struggle decisively in his favor. The agreement confirmed the Archbishop's control as chief lord of the town. Although out of his tender love and zeal for Beverly and his desire for its good order, rule and common weal, the burgesses could retain their free election of governors, albeit only from a body of 36 common councillors selected by the Archbishop. Lastly, to ensure a more quiet and peaceable election in the future, the agreement decreed that any person making business or disturbance against the good order, peace or tranquility of the town would lose his burgage and place in the town forever. However, several reasons outside the scope of this paper settlement was not to last. So in all three cases, the emotional lexicon of Star Chamber included obvious terms such as rage and fury, which most explicitly described both outward display and the intensity of illicit action. The same was true of more implicit descriptions of great, loud, high, terrible, noisy, opprobrious, and violent words and deeds, as well as the menaces, threats, and outcries of Elica and the rioters. These terms could easily be read over at first glance, but they also described the disorder and intensity of feeling and action that, in this judicial context, served to delegitimize the elections and brought them within the court's jurisdiction. According to these terms describing action, oh, added to these terms describing action, Elica's motive Motiva Elica's motivation was attributed to his hate and cruelty to the so-called substantial bur burgesses and his greedy mind to be a governor. The terms affectionate, love and favor were also used by both sides of the free election or riot debate to pejoratively ascribe motivation. Uh, it was used, affection for example, was used to describe the misplaced affection of those willful inhabitants for the rioters, as well as the claim that the archbishop's supporters have more affection for Lee than the Commonwealth of Beverly. By contrast, invocations of peace and quiet simultaneously indicated a moderate and restrained state of mind, manner of behavior, and an ideal social order, demonstrating the links between the physical body and body politic. The self-described quiet and honest inhabitants stressed that Elica's favoring of the commons above them, above them had brought the town into raw, grudge, murmur, debate, dissension, and perturbation. Similarly, the Archbishop claimed that the Elica's election was to the great inquietation and trouble of the townspeople themselves, whom he had vexed, troubled, inquieted, and put in prison after his re-election. Peace and quiet thus belonged to a cluster of socio-political terms referring to the tranquility, good order, rule, and commonwealth of Beverly, meaning that passions and affections were implicated in the discourse of common good and society as a whole. I've tried to use the word emotion as little as possible to categorize these terms as this is, a, this is a, uh, it's attempting to be a historicist study that examines the past in and through the terms and concepts used by people at the time. The Star Chamber lexicon just described includes terms that joined feeling, morality, motivation and action in ways that are largely recognizable as the modern emotion, but which also more widely included uh, terms such as emulation, aversion and revenge, which are unlikely to be listed among emotions today. So in terms of politics, historians such as Derek Hurst, Mark Kishlansky, and Richard Cust have described, have discussed predominantly 17th century elections in terms of whether they were contested elections representing individual voter choice and the discussion and resolution of ideological, religious or political questions, or rather if they were uncontested selections representing the top-down dominance of the gentry or urban oligarchies, reflecting localized contestations of authority over authority and status. However, focusing on the 14th to the 16th centuries, Christie and Liddy have shown how civic elections were contested and integral to concepts of citizenship and identity in the late, medi med med late medieval urban context and onwards. 
This paper has brought the history of emotions to bear on these studies of elections. Uh, insights from the history of emotions allow us to understand elections in and through the terms used by early modern people themselves and, the, and to see the politicized nature of emotional language. Uh, the paper reveals that emotional language was one of the means through which politics was discussed and enacted and that the intense and that intense emotional display was a key means by which illegitimacy was won or lost, turning a free election into a riot. Both the actual displays of emotion and how these displays were later described and utilized were therefore central parts of the, of the dynamics of politics and power. Thank you.